Welcome to Crosslink Community Church Podcast, where we prize Jesus, make disciples, and love people well. We are so glad you're here, and wherever you're listening from, we believe you will be more acquainted with the heartbeat of God through today's message. Good, good morning. The other announcement I have to make, if you don't know, um, uh, Joey and Nevea uh, had their beautiful little daughter a couple nights ago. Yeah, so... Uh, the, the mommy and the baby are doing well. Um, but, uh, yeah, just keep them in their prayers as they start this new journey together. Um, so with that, uh, man, uh, happy anniversary. Yeah, it literally has been, has been four years, uh, and it, it's crazy. Um, four years. Yeah. Uh, it, it's felt like four years at uh, times, um, and then like uh, a lot. I can't believe that it's been four years. And so uh, with that, it's, it's interesting the way things kind of lined up. We didn't, we didn't know that we were going to be doing the Annex, which is the, the series of finishing out uh, Hebrews 12 and 13. I, I didn't know um, where we'd be at in, in 13 um, for, for, for this Sunday or, or this, this month. And so, um, and I, I, we're going to bypass a few verses that we're going to come back to next week. Um, but I just felt like, man, what a great spot of scripture to land on, on this day. And, uh, it was four years ago that my wife and I came up with, and I think it was actually the Sunday, the 15th is so like literally four years ago where we came and we shared our hearts. Um, and, and here's the thing, what 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 has not changed is um, that our our desire our longing um, is to love people towards the ever loving Jesus that we get to serve. Like it's it's not changed, um, and and we've we've had the opportunity for the fast past four years to to navigate some crazy times and to re- remind ourselves that the reason why we do this um, isn't isn't just to to entertain or because it's the thing we're supposed to do, but the reason why we come together on a Sunday morning and why we invest in each other throughout um, the, the weeks is because, because we want to encourage each other towards Jesus. I don't know if you know this, but, but I need more grace today than I did even yesterday. And I need to know that there is a Savior who continually pursues my heart. And, and we want you to know that. Um, and so... So we're going to be in an interesting place. I will let you know, uh, there'll be awkward moments this morning between you and I. Good. I'm glad you're okay with that. Um, it, uh, because some of the things I'm going to have to share and talk about, um, we're, we're going to have those, those moments. But uh, uh, it's, it's fascinating where, where we are at. Um, have you ever like, needed help? Like, in, in a way where it's like, I shouldn't need help. You know what I mean? Like, like you should fully understand how to do what it is you need to do. Uh, well, I had that, I had that moment. I was in a restaurant the other day and it was a very dark restaurant and, uh, and I had to go to the bathroom. And so I'm like, well, I got to find the bathroom, which is always fun in a new restaurant. Found the bathroom. Um, and it was, it was, a, it was a one seater. Um, and it was just as dark as the rest of the restaurant. And, um, and I walk into to the bathroom, which, which is very small. And, and I, I couldn't find a light switch anywhere. I, l- I looked everywhere, uh, and I felt, you know that awkward moment, like you're feeling on the wall? And the problem is, like, the restaurant, in the entrance of this restaurant, like, there's tables who are watching me fill along the wall for a light switch. Now, there's this comedian who does a hilarious bit on the fact that he couldn't turn his light off in his hotel room, and he feels like he should be able to do that. Like, at my house, I know where all my light switches are, usually it's a standard practice to put them in the same spots and everywhere. So how do you then leave that bathroom to go find a waitress and say, hey, where's the light switch in the bathroom? And so I didn't know how to do that. So what I did, I left my phone at the table. I walked back to the table and I grabbed my phone and I'm walking back because I'm going to turn the light on on my phone and look for the light switch. And if I couldn't find it, we're just going to use the phone light. That's what I resorted to. And as I'm walking back, there was a regular sitting right there. She's like, hey, hey, just close the door. I said, what? She's like, there's no light switch. Just close the door. I said, "Mm, I don't know about you. So I go in there and I close the door. Light comes on immediately. Now, I found out that the owner of this restaurant likes to play with people. 
And so he did this on purpose because here's what happens. <laughs> People will go to him and say, hey, I can't turn on the, the light switch in the bathroom. And he's like, here's a flashlight. I'm sorry it's not working. And they walk in with the flashlight. And then immediately when they shut the door, the light comes on. I'm like, you are mean and amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. And, uh, and so I realized um, it was just one of those small moments where uh, – uh, if it wasn't for that regular in the room, I probably would have been laughed at by this guy. And so uh, it just reminds me of the importance of being together, uh, needing one another. Uh, and, and we'll see kind of how that plays out here in, in Hebrews chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Um, uh, because it's going to be a little awkward this morning, we provided chili afterwards. Um, so if you don't like what I have to say, eat chili. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we'll do. Um, but uh, we have been in Hebrews uh, chapter 13, um, started last week. And I'll just let you know, um, everything we're about to read, if you remember from the last two weeks, everything we're about to read is how we worship. M- meaning that th- chapter 13 is giving us applicable ways to worship. We don't need to wonder, what does it look like? Is it singing songs? Is it coming to church? He's literally laying out for us, um, this is what living a life that is grateful for what God has done, and then worship. Like, this is what it looks like. And so last week, we walked through this concept of loving one another and showing hospitality. This is just these acts of worship. And I will say, I find it amazing that as he's working through this, he is going to let you and I know this is, what, this is what worship looks like. You ready? We're going to start in verse 7. Like I said, we will come back to 4 through 6 next, next week. Here's, here's what 7 says. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, man, this is verse 8 or is a verse I've heard often. Like you have people who quote it all the time. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, in the context, I think it brings even more value. Um, but I, I want you to see this. A way of worship, living a life grateful of what God has done and is doing, is remembering the leaders in your life who spoke to you the word of God, and then consider the way or the outcome of the way of their life and imitate their their faith. Um, Now, this is a a dangerous thing in some ways because um, when it says make sure that you consider them and imitate their life does not mean that they should be put on a pedestal and that you're trying to aspire to where they are at. It's not what's going on here. And this is what happens with pastors and leaders across the board is that uh, congregations and people put them on this pedestal um, higher than they should be. And what ends up happening is uh, when they fall from that pedestal, which usually happens, um, then it wrecks people. So what this is saying is like, listen, consider the leaders in your life, those who have spoke to you the word of God, and then begin to imitate their faith. Because what God knows that you and I need, because he designed us to be so, is we need something tangible. I don't know if you remember from last week, but he says, those of you who say that you love God, but don't love your brother, are lying. The way to show that you love God is loving your brother because the way God wired you and I to be is that we typically need something tangible in front of us that encourages us and spurs us on. So when he says, consider the leaders, the ones who spoke to you, who preached to you and their way of life, imitate their faith because at least you have some sort of glimpse of what it should look like. Now, I'm going to give you six names. I think there's six. I I have more. I'm going to give you six uh, leaders in my life, men in my life who, who uh, have shaped who I am. The first one being Rusty Brooks. He was my youth pastor. Uh, he bought me banana splits. <laughs> and uh, he loved me even when I didn't love back. He, he encouraged me towards Jesus when I didn't want to believe in Jesus. Um, he was always there. The reason why I got into ministry was because of Rusty Brooks. 
when, when Jesus Christ transformed my life at college, I remembered the one guy in my life that loved me, was there for me, regardless of anything I was going through. It was Rusty. And so when I decided to go into ministry, I said, you know what? If all I do, if all I can do is impact one person the way he impacted me, I'm good. So that's what did. Rusty Brooks is no longer with us. He passed away several years ago. And I'll be honest with you, his life did not end well. But as I consider his life and his love for me, it does not change the impact and the love he had towards me. John Garner. I love God's word more than I can explain because of this guy, John Garner. I don't, I don't know. I, I didn't go to, this may be a surprise to you, I don't know. I didn't go to seminary. Um, I was never very good at school. Uh, when I was at Grace College, which is a Christian university, and there were Bible classes, uh, if you asked me what I learned during those, I could tell you nothing because I was not a very good student. Um, but in, in 2004, when my wife and I were beat up and bruised because of church, uh, because of things that we walked through in church, and we didn't know where to turn, we ended up at this church that became a place of healing for us. And I met some men there who were the pastors who loved me incredibly well. But the one thing, the one thing that John Garner showed me was how living and active and alive God's word is. The way he taught it moved me. Encouraged me to want to know it myself. And, and you want to know what good preaching looks like? Good preaching looks like um, when you hear it, it moves you to want to dive into scriptures on your own, to go deeper into what it is that God has for you. And when I, when I would sit at the feet of John Garner, I was blown away by the wisdom and abilities he had to share with me God's word. He was the one who gave me a love and a passion for scriptures. And he is no longer with us. <laughs> he passed away a couple years ago. Scott Feather, a leader in my life, a leader that came into my life at my lowest point. I thought I was, my life was going to take a change in a direction that would have been very bad. Uh, Scott Feather, was uh, a guy who actually was in my life at my lowest points, lowest point. My two lowest points in my life, a phone, one of them, the, 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 the second one, just one phone call, five hours away, he was there that night. Um, him and his wife have shown myself and my wife what it looks like to love the Lord and show grace. What it means to walk through forgiveness and difficulty. I am who I am today because of Scott Feather. Um, David Ellis. If you can catch it by the last name, that would be my dad. My passion for the church, my passion for commitment to the church, um, my passion for my family to be in church came from how my dad led his family. Uh, when we moved to Florida in 2004 and walked through something while we were down in Florida in 2004, um, if my wife didn't grow up in, in a pastor's home, and I didn't grow up in the home that told us church matters, um, I guarantee you, I believe we would have walked away from church in 2004. Completely walked away. The stuff that we saw and experienced, it was, it was enough. And so um, 
But there was this thing gnawing, this low-grade gnaw in my heart that says, no, even though I think the church looks ugly, I cannot call ugly what God calls holy, so I'm going to trust he has a plan. Okay? So, so i got to believe, even though it doesn't look good to me, that he still calls it his bride, and it still matters. And so we stayed focused and committed These are men who have impacted my life greatly. Another one, he doesn't know it, Matt Chandler. (laughs) He's he's just a megachurch pastor. Um, But his sermons have got me through some very difficult times. So so when when I say it starts out with, here's what worship looks like. Remember your leaders. Can you begin to think about, consider the leaders in your life, the men in your life that you've allowed to have the position above you to teach and train you so that guides and direct? Do you have men and women like that who are kind of spurring you on that direction? Because worship looks like this. Remember, consider your leaders and imitate their faith. In fact, um, if it wasn't for these men, I don't know where I'd be because my proclivity is to pursue and hang around those who are like-minded to me. It's, I, I could, we could list off a whole bunch of people around me who if I imitated them, it would end badly. But I, 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 I have learned through navigating this life, knowing to, um, that, that I, I can't do this alone, that I needed men in my life that were going to instill in me what it meant and what it looked like to pursue Jesus. So here's what's crazy. Even though it says, consider your leaders, imitate their faith, it's followed by verse 8. Never lose that. Jesus, Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Meaning, you can still believe in Jesus when one of the leaders that you considered and remembered and impacted you, when their faith is fickle. Because ultimately, our faith and trust is in Jesus, not the man. So, so, so there's this, there's this thing. Listen, consider your leaders, watch them, because we need tangible people in our life who are directing us. But you need to understand, my faith is fickle, your faith is fickle. You're gonna be um, kind of let down by men and women in your life who you thought had a strong faith and then maybe walked away. Here's what I'm saying: you can still consider them, but remember this: Jesus is the same yesterday, t- today, and forever. He is the ultimate authority. He is our north star. He will never let you down. He'll never forsake you. He will always be there, and we are bad representations sometimes of his faith. So you need to understand, and you need to remember that Jesus loves you regardless of where you're at or where you're going. Now, it's good for some of us who need to nurse some wounds, who have been let down by said leaders, to remember that we're not on levels. We're at the foot of the cross together, just pressing in to Jesus together, remembering that he is the same. Now, let's continue, if you don't mind. Verse 9, that's what it says. "Do Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods. I do like food, though which have not benefited those who devoted to them. We'll, we'll talk about that part in a second. But look at this. Do not, do not be led away by diverse teachings or diverse and strange teachings, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well. But uh, it's, it's interesting that the writer of Hebrews knew the downfall of social media and YouTube. Like, I can't believe it. Like, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he writes down, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. Almost like he knew that we were going to be inundated with diverse and strange teachings. It's fascinating. It doesn't change. There's nothing new under the sun. Just as much as the true gospel is being preached, there were things coming alongside that were trying to debunk that gospel and pull people away from it. It is still the same. And I would argue that it's getting 
crazier because although there are many Bibles in many homes, people in those homes are spending less time in those Bibles. And so people don't know the very words of God. They only know what they've been taught. And so what that tells me implicitly is that an act of worship, being grateful, receiving a kingdom that will not be shaken, worshiping God in acceptable ways is knowing his words so that you're not pulled away by strange and diverse teachings. Uh, it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. Meaning, um, there is nothing, nothing that needs to be added to Jesus. It is Jesus only. I mean, we just got done singing the song, only Jesus. It couldn't be more true. His grace is sufficient. His sacrifice is sufficient. All of this, the teachings about Jesus and how he takes your ugliness, your badness, your sin, your unrighteousness. He takes that upon himself at the cross and then in your belief in him, he gives you his righteousness, his beauty, his identity, his uh, place in his family. Like that happens. That's all you need to understand. There's nothing more. It's not Jesus plus anything. And so what was going on, especially during this time, is, okay, yeah, Jesus, that's cool, that's great, but make sure you still do a lot of the ceremonial things. Make sure you still practice Judaism. Make sure you're doing this, because yes, Jesus, but you still need to offer um, sacrifices at the temple. It's important for you to go to these ceremonial uh, festivals to make sure that you stay in good accord with God, as if God's son was not enough. That's what was being taught. And so there's this pull for them away from Jesus back to other things. And listen, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, sermons are being preached every moment of every day. There are things that you will learn when you leave here. Things you'll see on YouTube, on social media, things that you read. Your heart is constantly being pulled in a direction. Constantly. And hear me when I say this. The safest place for your heart to be is in the hands of a gracious God. This is what happens. Uh, verse 11, note 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Um, the author is, in a way, just establishing the Levitical ceremonial sacrifices that were needed to atone the sinful people. And, uh, and they are telling people to go back to that, although we know because it says earlier in Hebrews that Jesus is the once for all sacrifice, that when he sacrificed his body and he resurrected from the grave, he sat down at the right hand of the Father to let you and I know it is finished, all right? So this is important to let us know that the altar we are now at is coming to the cross because the greatest once for all sacrifice happened there. His name is Jesus. We don't need to go back to this system, but that's what was happening. But this is what the author says, which is brilliant. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate, or in some translations, outside the camp, in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. Typically what it means to be outside the city, outside the camp, outside the gate, is the institutional Judaism rejected Jesus, put, them, put him outside of the gate as not a way to access God. And so the author's like, eh, they can do that. Let's just go join him. Let's go, let's go outside the gate. But you need to understand, um, metaphorically speaking, to be outside the city, to be outside the, the camp, to be outside the gate is not a safe place. 
You need to understand that being where Jesus is at, according to this text, to join him is also to join him in his reproach and suffering. That there's going to be a chance that if you stand for the grace of Jesus Christ, that there's going to be other things that are going to come against you. That there are going to be other teachings that are going to say, that's not right. That there are going to be political ways that are going to say, no, you're closed-minded. That there are going to be things that are going to happen that are going to try to pull you away. But I believe the safest place, although it's a dangerous place to be, is with Jesus outside the gate. Because it seems like those inside the gate were being led astray. And their hearts and souls were not safe. And so I prefer for my heart and soul to be secured, even if there are adversaries coming full speed ahead outside the city um this is amazing uh, i just had a thought you're like let's see i had a thought i'll tell you about it in a second verse 14 for here we have no lasting city but we seek the city that is to come meaning This ain't our home. It's okay to bear the reproach. This isn't our home. Shouldn't we understand that it's a painful process because it's not our home? If you don't believe me, when you go home into your neighborhood, go to a neighbor's house, walk in and sit on the couch. Just see what kind of reaction you get. Uh, excuse me, this is not your home, sir. How'd you get in here? Yeah, the front door is open. Like it would not, this is not our home. So there should be awkwardness. There should be tension. There should be some reproach. This is not our home. We will be home. We have the opportunity to reveal, to give, to offer the kingdom right now that we will be in for eternity. But this is not our home. So look at the response. Through him, Jesus then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. We finally got to singing. (laughs) Like when you talk about worship, that's the first place we go. And the author's like, we'll get to it eventually. There are so many other things. There's a living, a lifestyle of worship that happens. And then once we get down here, we see we've received um, this kingdom that cannot be shaken. We approach this altar that says it is finished through Jesus. And because we then go with him outside the camp, we now have reason to sing and celebrate and offer up a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips. Hmm. I don't know if I should say this. You want to see your belief in Jesus to strengthen. Your love for him to be underpinned. You want to see your life for him begin to change. Actually start singing. Listen, it's not just something we do at the beginning of service because it gets you guys awake. We give you coffee for that. Have you have you ever been in that moment where you're like, man, I just want to let it go? You're like, I can't die. I'll be judged. Like, like you've watched people at football games, right? They're crazy. Don't, don't, don't you think what we have in Jesus deserves more praise than anything else we see happen around us? Like, and so, so here's what I'm saying. Even if you don't like it, like, I, Jeremy, that's not my personality. I don't like to sing. I can't sing. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Great. I understand. We're all made different. We're cut different. I get it. Just try. Start singing and praising Until God aligns your heart with his to where it no longer is forced, but it's now honest. Just just throwing that out there. Because I I have to, because it says it here. This is what we do. Continually offer up sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our 
lips in the acknowledgement of his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Meaning, be aware, look around, invest and engage in those to make sure we are all taken care of. One of the major tenets of the original church was no one had too much and no one had too little. It's crazy. I don't know how that plays out, but it's crazy. Can you imagine as a church, we still operated in some of those ways. Now, before we read 17, I just want to let you know, this is where it gets awkward. I'm about to read two words that nobody, nobody likes, right? Uh, unless you're Enneagram 1 or A-type personality. Uh, verse 17, ready? We're, we're reading close to being done because I know there's chili. Uh, th- okay, before I read it, before I read it, th- this is an act of worship, right? Let you know. Is it already up there? Unbelievable. All right, listen. This is... <laughs> This, when, it, when it talks about this chapter, we're responding in worship. Right? Here's what it says. Verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. So, so I tried that in the room over here. My wife was standing next to me. I said, hey, can you tie my shoe? I can't reach it. And I lifted up my shoe. And she's like, you've got to be kidding me. I was like, the text today says obey your leaders and submit. That didn't go over well. Um, (laughs) Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. I, I urge you, the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you sooner. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. Um, So before I continue, uh, I've been the pastor here for four years. The one thing that was very vital and important to me was that we would... uh, eventually get to having a leadership team, a spiritual leadership team that would stand beside me, with me, would have meetings around a circle, circle, a round table. I'm low on my Scott Vandergrift. That we, those, anyways, inside joke, my bad. Uh, Sit around a round table, uh, have have discussions on how to govern, lead, and direct this church. It took a while to get there. Um, through all the, the ups and downs and direction that we were going as a church. Uh, so, so what I need to do is I, I need to let you know who your leaders are in the room. So, so I'm going to ask Ron to stand up and uh, Scott to stand up. And Billy, are you in? Is Billy in here? Yeah. Um, so that was three in the back, back row Baptist. Um, these, are, these are the men who currently um, are the spiritual leadership team, meaning they're the ones keeping watch over your soul with me. They're the ones who, this is, this is not a Jeremy show. I, I think, which we're going to talk about in a moment as we wrap this thing up. But th- this is not about me. Uh, this, is, this is the four of us right now together trying to figure out how, how can we love you, encourage you, and serve you towards Jesus. M- meaning those three men should be spending tons of time in God's word at his feet desiring to know his voice and his direction and his spirit. Like that's, that's what, like, like what, what do we want to do as, as a leadership team is that we want to be so enthralled in God's word that we sit under his waterfall of grace and hear his voice as we lead this church. Now, I, I'm going to share with you what, what the leader's responsibilities are and then what your responsibilities are and then we'll be done. Got it? I'm going to read it. It's going to go up on the screen. You don't have to turn there unless you want to. It's in Acts 20. Um, it's, it's easy to list to you what these responsibilities are for, for the leaders because Paul is going to tell us in Acts 20. It's going to start in verse 22. This is what it says. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing 
what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city, that in every city, imprisonment and afflictions await me. That's great ministry. Like, what? What? But I do, I do not account my life of any value nor of precious to myself if only I am to finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. He knows he's more likely going to die. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of you all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So now he's talking to the leaders, the elders of Ephesus, the pastors of Ephesus. And and this is what he's going to say. This is your job as a leader. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So so this isn't a church that the leaders obtained. This isn't a church that I earned, I purchased. This church, Crosslink, Church of Ephesus, was purchased by Jesus. We are called as leaders just to oversee, to pay attention to, to care for those whom God has obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. It's clear that that one of the main purposes as leaders of this church is to protect and fight off the wolves that are ever pressing and ever devouring. Uh, so, just to let you know what that looks like, that's not always people. That's false doctrines, false teachings. That's people who want to grow a crowd for themselves. Listen, I'll be I'll be honest with you. As 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 a man who who whose love language is words of affirmation, it has always been a dangerous place for me. Because the moment I do this because of the affirmation is the moment this church will stop moving forward with me here. It's dangerous to have pastors and preachers who try to grow a crowd, to have a following, to be appreciated and affirmed. It's dangerous. But here's what I promise you. If you're preaching only Jesus, if your um, one aim is to make him known, to make the grace of Jesus known, then it will be difficult and hard. But as your leaders, we will fend off the fierce wolves, the twisted things that draw disciples away. Therefore, be alert remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So if I was to give you in one sentence our job, our goal here as your leaders, that is to equip you, love you towards um, to to make sure the doctrine that we teach is right, that the theology that we preach is accurate so that your faith will persevere to the end and your soul will stay tethered to Jesus and your heart will be strengthened in the depth and riches of the love and grace of Jesus Christ. That's, that's our goal here. It's, it's not, man, it's not to entertain. You, you know what? My, my job is not to go on guilt trips, convict you. Uh, my, my job is not to entertain you. My, my job, and this is dangerous, my job is not to be the Holy Spirit. You know how many pastors change their message depending on who walks in the building? 
I'm just saying it happens. Oh, they need to hear this. I'm going to write this right now. I got one for you. It's, it's not good. I want to be a church where we're preaching and teaching the full counsel of God's word, the grace and mercies of Jesus as him being the once for all, only sacrifice for sins, the only way to the heavenly father will preach and teach Jesus. And as we do that, you grow deeper in your faith and in your love for him. That when you leave here, you're boat that navigates this life isn't pretty and pristine but the ballast that keeps you above water is their working order it's our job i know you're wondering what yours is so i know you see i want you to come on i need some music behind this part <laughs> obey and submit to your leaders. First thing that's important is that this is not done blindly. What I mean, there's reference in I think Acts 17 about a group of people called the Bereans. When Paul taught and preached, they took in what he said, dissected it, investigated it to make sure it lined up with God's words. So, so that's important. Your job as people who attend here is to listen to what is being brought before you, taught, spoken about, sung about, to take that in, to drink it in, to, to kind of weigh it out against God's word, which means um, implicitly that you should be then also in God's word so that when you hear something that seems a bit off, you're ready to, okay, I don't know, let's talk about that. The problem is now is that most churches just fill the building with People who are like recently converted or not even believers and they just entertain them and they're entertaining them and they have no depth and they have no understanding and so they'll follow them anywhere they go because they're funny and awesome and we like them. Come to my church because of my pastor. And so you have that thing going on and it's dangerous. And what would it be like? Come to my church because we value the doctrines and theology of Scripture. Our faith is deepened, strengthened. So, so your, your job, and if I can make it applicable to obey and submit to your leaders, is, is to not do it blindly. Know God's word as you listen to it. The, the second one is this, through your devotion and commitment. This is why we have chili for this statement. I'm going to say this boldly. I, Chris and I were talking about like four years, man. What do we want to do? Like, do we want to set a challenge before people? Do we want to encourage? Like, I, I don't know. I like, I, I didn't know how, how to like bring that challenge. And, and then this text came up. <laughs> the best way to obey and submit to your leadership is your commitment. commitment. The average person attends church 1.5 times a month according to statistics. I'm sorry. That's not a family member here at Cross Lake. This matters. And I feel like I can say this four years in because I hope, I hope you have seen how much my family loves you. Ah, oh, man. I hope you understand. But when it says that an act of worship is to obey and submit to your leaders, it means your devotion and commitment as your presence in the family that is here. Just so you know, one of the greatest encouragements to me is that maybe you just show up because you wanted to be an encouragement to me. I do think it's interesting because over the past 10, 15 years, 
it's not that people don't value church, it's that it's just moved down in the priority list. It used to be in the top three. Now it's, man, it was a late night, I can't go. There, there's, like, it's just moved down. And, and I honestly believe, like, I can justify. 70, I think it was 73% of people who attend church don't believe that the sermon that was preached that day is actually applicable to their living. Well, no wonder. If you, don't, if you don't leave here equipped and encouraged to go deeper in your faith, to know how to love your wife better, to know how to engage your children better, to be a part of a community that is involved and invested, then no wonder it's moved down in priority. But I will tell you this, as your leaders, we are committed. We are committed to that not being the case here. Um, two more and then we're done. Number three is your dedication. I'm, I'm just going to say this, and we'll, we'll, it'll be it. Just let your yes be yes. I, there is a Bible verse to that, but I don't want to proof text that statement. What I'm saying is, when you say yes, let it be yes. What it takes to, to be a family here, what you don't see and what it takes, like, like it's dependent on your yeses being yes. Because when your yes turns into, oh, I said yes, but I didn't mean yes. I'm sorry, I won't. I can't tell you how it starts to wither away other family members here. So, so when it says submit and, or obey and submit to your leaders, what, what that means is let your yes be yes. And, and we, we, will, we will do and try our hardest to make sure that we operate the same way. Last one. And this is part of the last part of this. Let them, let your pastors who are keeping watch over your souls, let them do this with joy and not groaning so that, because that would be no advantage to you. Your, your fourth applicable way to obey and submit is be an encouragement. Because the two men I mentioned earlier who impacted my life greater than I could ever say, one took his own life. And the other one, if you would ask him, he would probably tell you that pastoring broke his heart because it was so hard. Why? Why does it have to be so hard? Why can't we just commit to one another? Let our yes be yes. Invest and engage. Encourage. Why, why do we have to be so offended by the little things? Why, why does it have to be so hard? Why do we have to complain? Do we not understand that there are battles that are going on around us? And if we just unite as under the one banner, that Jesus only, can you imagine the things that can happen? last thing the hardest part of the text I don't know if you saw it but it wasn't it wasn't the word obey and it wasn't the word submit it was because the leaders will give an account I don't think I can explain to you how heavy that is you can ask my wife you can pull her aside later but to make sure I'm teaching you right theology of love for Jesus, to, to, to make sure I'm doing what God has called me to do. Now I shut down on Saturdays. It gets heavy and hard because there will be a day. There will be a day where I'll stand before God in heaven and give an account for how I led you. It's why I don't want there to be any more of you. Can you imagine a church of a thousand? No, I don't want that. We're in this together. Four years in, we're committed. 
So this is a challenge today. It's a challenge for us to see what God is going to do in the next four. I'm going to pray. Sierra's going to sing a song. and We'll do announcements and we'll eat chili together and celebrate. Thank you for being here. It means much to me. Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you do. We thank you that your words are hard, but your spirit is kind. That your love is great and your mercy is ever enduring. Thank you for the men and women and families represented in this room. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate four years when many people can't even get there. And I'm just, I'm just thankful that we are moving forward, making much of your son Jesus together. Let it be another several years of prizing Jesus, your son, making disciples and loving people well. As Sierra sings a song, Father, it's my desire that you, you just move our hearts and our minds, that we leave here with a deeper understanding of who you are. We love you. Thank you for listening to Crosslink Community Church Podcast. If you would like more information about our church, please visit our website at www.crosslinkchurch.com or join us in person on Sunday mornings at 1020 a.m. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss a single message and share with a friend. Thank you again for listening.